Good afternoon, Europe and Africa. Good evening, Asia. Good morning, America. Welcome to a new session of the Networking Fridays at the Atlantic International Research Center, the Air Center. I'm Miguel Bello Mora. I'm the CEO of the Air Center. And today we have a very special session in a very special day. Yesterday, the new NASA mission Perseverance landed in the Red Planet. But this is not the only mission to Mars in this window. The Chinese probe Tangwen 1 and the United Arab Emirates hope also reached this planet. This is the best evidence that the space exploration is not just limited to a couple of big countries, but it is an endeavor of the whole mankind. And space activities are well spread in many nations in all continents. In this scenario of space activities around the world, we couldn't have a better invited speaker than Simonetta Di Pippo, one of the most relevant persons in the global space landscape. Simonetta Di Pippo is director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, UNOSA. She leads the office's strategic policy and programmatic activities and advises the United Nations Secretary General on Space Affairs. She was also director of human spaceflight at the European Space Agency and director of the observation of the universe at the Italian National Space Agency. She's an academician of the International Academy of Astronautics and a member of the WEF Global Future Council on Space Technology since 2016 and each co-chair since 2020. She co-founded Women in Space Europe in 2009 and in 2017 became a UN International Gender Champion. She holds a master's degree in astrophysics and space physics from University La Sapienza in Rome, uh, but also hon honoris causa degree in environmental studies and honoris causa degree of Doctor in International Affairs. In addition, Simonetta has a large number of awards and recognitions. Mrs. Di Pippo was knighted by the President of the Italian Republic in 2006. And in 2008, the International Astronomical Union assigned the name Di Pippo to an asteroid, the asteroid number 21887 of the series, in recognition of her efforts in space exploration. She was also featured in a publication of her story, a celebration of leading women in the United Nations, a tribute to women's participation in the development of the United Nations. Among other awards, she was awarded the Hubert Kurian Award in 2018 as the first woman laureate. Well, it's a, it's a very large CV. We can only make a short, a, a short presentation. Today, Simonetta's presentation titled Space Technology for Economic Development will dive into how space data technology and application can be a transformative force for the economy based on the initial funding of the Space Economy Initiative. 2020 saw the launch of the Space Economy Initiative, a new UN platform and the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs tasked to bring emerging and non-space failing countries together to strengthen their space economy. The space Economy Initiative is tailored to support public and private space sector stakeholders by providing a global platform for practitioners from established and emerging space economies at the UN level. This initiative, the Space Economy Initiative, is the first of this kind. Today, all mankind is looking for the recovery of our economies after the terrible pandemic. And Simonetta shall address how a space economy can contribute to generate high skill jobs, very much needed for this recovery period. Before we start, I would like to, to, to remember to the, to the participants to place all your questions in the Q&A sector, not, not in the chat. And uh, please, Simonetta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Miguel, for this opportunity. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with you. Now let's wait for the presentation to be, uh, to be shared. Um, yeah, uh, it is, as I said, it's really a pleasure for me um, to have this opportunity to present uh, on one side, the work of the Office for Outer Space Affairs at the United Nations, and, uh, and in parallel also how space technology can really help for socioeconomic development, and in particular, due to this pandemic situation, how space and space economy can help building back better. Uh, the next one, please. Well, first of all, let me give you a brief uh, summary uh, of um, the, uh, let's say a brief description of what UNUSA is. Um, we call it the UN Home for Space. And it's in reality the only office, the only UN entity dedicated to space affairs in the United Nations, 
there are a lot of other entities in offices of the secretariat which are using space for their own I mean, to fulfill their own mandates but uh, as I said, you know, it's the only one, 100% dedicated to space affairs. And so what we do is really to work with a lot of our partners, uh, the, the other one, the previous one, yeah, thank you, uh, to work with the other part, with a lot of partners uh, from across the space sector. So we work for sure with national governments, but also with regional and national space agencies, private entities, civil society, including academia and the and NGOs, and also all the other UN entities, in particular in Vienna, New York, and Geneva, but also in the field. And one of the elements that we always um, are underlining uh, when we talk about uh, the current role of the Office for Outer Space Affairs um, is, is that uh, in reality, after the 2015, uh, September 2015 approval, of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I'll talk a, a lot about, about the SDGs during, during the presentation, but uh, here I want to say that um, we are focusing a lot uh, on, on all the SDGs, but in particular, you know, SDG number 17, which is Partnerships for the Goals, also helped us to start a certain number of um, quite uh, unique features in the, in the kind of relationships that we have with the partners in particular with private entities and civil society, which was not part of the portfolio of the office before. And so we are really trying to foster innovation, to foster diversity, and to have integrated efforts with all the partners, trying to network, uh, uh, to networking and to uh, trying to cooperate uh, really uh, with, with all the partners that have uh, the willingness to do so. And let me tell you that they are growing and growing with, with a lot of satisfaction for us. So the next one, please. Um, uh, in, in a nutshell, um, uh, we have uh, certain functions which are related to serving the uh, member states as Secretariat of COPOS. And uh, uh, so we have member states, uh, currently COPOS has 95 member states. Um, and, uh, and but also we serve the two subcommittees and uh, and also the working groups. But then there is also the technical side of the office where we do a lot of things. Um, these are just the main activities and I'll talk a lot about others and uh, I mean programs, initiatives and projects a little bit later, even if clearly I cannot be exhaustive. Uh, I'll, I'll try just to um, underline the, the few of the, the the most important ones. For sure, we have the program on space application, uh, which dates back 72. Um, we have the UN register of the objects launched into outer space, which is a responsibility that we discharge for the Secretary General. Um, and we have, for example, the UN spider program is now listed here, uh, but there's the program dealing with, um, uh, with assisting member states in providing space-based data and services. Um, uh, for uh, allowing these member states to manage the full disaster cycle and, uh, and the emergency response phase in particular. But also we have other mechanisms. For example, we are working hard uh, as executive secretariats, but also uh, supporting in technical terms, the ICG, which is the International Committee on Global Navigation Satellite Systems, where we put together all the providers and the users interested in joining. And uh, in this manner, we, ran the, we, we facilitate the various um, GNSS constellations to become interoperable, et cetera, et cetera. If you want more information, you can go on our website, um, I mean, from generic perspective. So, uh, also, the, at the very end, we, what we do 100% is to support member states. On one side, supporting member states through servicing, through the service uh, that we provide to COPOS and the two subcommittees and the working groups. And on, this, on the other side, I mean, with capacity building, with training, uh, with, um, with awareness raising, et cetera, et cetera. So it, with the technical side. Overall, if in a nutshell, we, will, we want to describe uh, what UNUSA is, we would say is a capacity builder. So the entire office is really able to provide um, cutting edge space data and information and support member states in building capacity to use such data 
to accelerate their socioeconomic development in a sustainable manner. Secondly, uh, you can consider us as a convener. So we are a sort of a platform to really bring all the stakeholders at the same table and facilitate policy and decision-making. And last but not least, we are the getaway to, uh, UN, uh, to the UN in terms of space affairs. And so we also coordinate all the UN activities related to using space-related technology, again, supporting sustainable development. And you see here the picture where we will live here in Vienna. So that's the building where we are. Next one, please. Um, in, a, in, in reality, yes, we are the UN home for space, but we are also the hub for space affairs solutions. In reality, we are really at the center of development and implementation of the international rigor regime in outer space through COPIUS, supported by us. Um, we have uh, to consider that the UN treaties and principles on outer space are really uh, at the center of what we call global space governance. Uh, COPIUS has been always a forum for debating peaceful uses of outer space now since six decades. And what we do, we, we, you and USA, we facilitate multilateral exchanges and works to advance international cooperation for the peaceful uses of outer space. Um, and in reality, um, it's extremely important that all the players in the space community um, consider themselves responsible uh, for, for their uh, behavior. And, uh, and if everyone is playing by the book uh, and following the rules, well, we can really uh, hope that we can maintain the space environment um, available for use for the uh, next generations to come. Next one, please. Um, if we want to have uh, just a look at the composition of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and the importance of it, well, it was established in 59 with a de um, dedicated GA resolution. Um, clearly, um, if you look at the situation in terms of expansion of the membership, when it was created uh, was, uh, was, was really the, the, the first pool of uh, the first set of members uh, becoming, becoming members of the member states, becoming members of the committee were the 18. And uh, currently uh, they are 95. Well, here you can see uh, 95 in 2020. In reality, I have to say that 95 in 2019, because I had uh, one of my goals was to reach 100 in 2020. And we were quite close to reach this goal. Unfortunately, as you know, the pandemic um, um, in a way um, uh, stopped us from, from, from reaching this goal because we had to postpone and postpone copious. And then at the very end, the session was held uh, in, in an hybrid mode and only for the administrative tasks. So there was no the possibility, there was no possibility for anyone who already asked to become a member, I mean, applied for becoming a member, uh, there was no possibility to discuss that. So I hope that in 2021, we will be able at the couple session that has been already postponed by a couple of months due again to the pandemic situation, we will be able to, uh, to really uh, reach 100. In any case, even when we talk about 95, uh, you see the map here, and you see also that the current membership is representing over 6 billion people. And uh, on top of that, um, when I took up duty, uh, the member states were 75, so we increased of about 25%. And uh, in addition, um, also the number of permanent ob observers uh, more or less doubled. So now we have 42 observer organizations. The next one, please. So, um, oh, the previous one. Okay. Um, well, if we go now a little bit more on, on the substantive matter, um, this slide is just to show that um, there is no field in the um, in, in in all the activities we do in uh, on Earth and in space, uh, but in particular on Earth uh, without space. 
And so there is an interconnection between what we do in space and how space can benefit uh, everyone everywhere on earth. So uh, it's extremely important that we talk about sustainability, not only on earth, but also in space, because the, the two elements are strongly interconnected. And so in reality, I could talk really a lot about the different fields in which you can use space data, technology and applications, going from monitoring of the climate change to, uh, to uh, for, uh, I mean, activities for humanitarian aid or uh, um, assessing the impact of space weather on, on our infrastructures or uh, developing uh, the abilities of new countries to become, I mean, countries developing and emerging to become space-faring countries. But I'll give you a little bit more details uh, in a few minutes. Um, in reality, I mentioned already the 2015 approval, uh, in September 2015, the approval of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17th Sustainable Development Goals. And what we did at that time with the Office for Outer Space Affairs was to remap the current and future activities we, we had um, uh, in, in, um, in link with, in, in sync in a way with the 17 sustainable development goals. And so we started to uh, realize and, and to, you know, uh, try to increase the awareness uh, in member states and in all the, our stakeholders that space is really a game changer. Is, is an agent of change. And um, what we did even uh, three years ago, we published uh, a report, you see here the, the cover page, together with the um, GSA, the European GNSS Agency, now EUSPA, um, which, and, and what we did together was to analyze the 169 targets underpinning the SDGs, the 17 SDGs. We analyzed all these 169 targets combining EGNSS, which means EGNOS plus Galileo, and Copernicus, which is the European Earth Observation Program. Um, and combining these two, and also in a very conservative manner, we found that 65 out of 169 targets, so almost 40%, are reliant on geolocation and Earth observation. Now, if we add the SATCOMs, and satellites with a higher resolution, Earth observation satellites with a higher resolution, we believe that this 40% um, increases up to 50% as a minimum, which means that there are no decision making, no policy making possible without space. And member states cannot reach, they are not able to reach by 2030 their uh, goals. Uh, as uh, let's say set up by the um, by the um, the General Assembly resolution in 2015, without having space as the key tool for doing so. But then, if we look at the climate, well, um, I, I'm always saying that if you attend a summit on climate, if you attend a conference on climate, you really hear very little about the importance of space in monitoring the variables um, for um, linked to, 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 I mean, to, to climate change. But if you look at the essential climate variables, the 54 essential climate variables, more than half can only be measured, can only be monitored from space. So it's absolutely mandatory that also in the case of climate, we consider space at the center. So in reality, what we are, I'm trying to do here is that science and in particular space must be put at the center again of all the decision and policy making processes in developed and in developing country, countries as well. The next one, please. And if we look at the evolution of space activities, well, uh, uh, it, this, is, this is unbelievable. I mean, you see clearly uh, that uh, if, you, if you see the, the, the blue line, well, these are the countries uh, with at least one satellite historically in orbit. It doesn't mean that these countries 
have a satellite currently in orbit, it means that at least once they had a satellite in orbit. Well, we started in 57 with one Soviet Union at that time with Sputnik, and now we are, uh, uh, in 2020, we reached uh, 83. But even more important is the green mm, plot. You see, in 2019, we registered 581 space objects launched into space. In 2020, we just doubled the, the, the number of objects registered. In one year, we doubled the number of objects launched. And if we are now mid-February in 2021, if we count already 227 satellites launched. And if we keep this speed in a way, clearly at the end of 2021, we will have far more than 1,265 satellites, which is the number launched in 2020. You see clearly that we absolutely need to do something. We do need to be able to keep a little bit more under control, also from the standpoint of the regulations and, and, and the frameworks uh, under which all these activities have to be regulated. Otherwise, very quickly, uh, the space environment will not be usable anymore, not even for future generations, but even, even now or, or in the very near future. The next one, please. So, if we want to uh, really summarize on three pillars, uh, the main trends in terms of space developments, I, I, I believe that this can be done easily, uh, dividing the, the, the in, three, in three blocks. I mean, science and technology, economy, and legal and policy. If we look at science and technology, as I said already, uh, already just a few seconds ago, that the number of objects in space is really uh, growing rapidly, and so is the number of active space debris. Uh, sorry, the uh, space debris. Currently, uh, overall, we have 3,000, over 3,000 active satellites uh, in orbit. Uh, mega constellations, as you know, are coming online. Um, there are few new technologies like active debris removal being developed in several countries. Uh, accessibility to space is increasing. But if we look at the situation, we have 95 member states in COPUS out of 193 member states of the United Nations, so more or less half of them, and 83, as I just showed a few seconds ago to you, 83 countries with one satellite in orbit, which means that we are more than 100 states in the world, members of the United Nations, so more or less all of them, still lagging behind. And the other point is that we, are, we see more and more um, uh, stakeholders knocking on the door, participating to the activities, expressing their ideas, and in particular, more and more stakeholders and, and space actors who really want to develop and launch space hardware in, in um, space hardware. So, if we move all of the, I mean, if you consider all of this and we go to the economy side of the economy block, it's important to know to notice that um, space economy was valued at over 400 billion US dollars uh, right now for the projections in 2040s, uh, which states between one and three trillions. Commercial space activities are quickly growing and currently they represent 80%, around 80% of the overall value. Uh, the private companies um, seeking to continue expanding, uh, even in domains which were exclusively in the past occupied by governments. You can, you see clearly what Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are doing. Uh, satellites contribute to more than 10% of GDP in EU, Germany and UK. And satellites will be instrumental for post COVID-19 recovery and in the push for greener economy. This is something we, we will go back um, in a in few minutes when I'll, I'll, I'll touch in detail the, the space economy initiative that we have. 
And if we want to briefly talk about the legal and policy block, well, uh, I said already that uh, um, there is absolutely a strong need that all the, 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 the main players understand the importance of maintaining the safety, security, and sustainability of other space activities. We do need an increased international cooperation in all fields, also in, in, uh, in um, new uh, activities, at least for the office, in terms of planetary defense and protection. And it's, it's absolutely mandatory that a, each and every new actor understand uh, that it's better for its own uh, activity even to uh, start with a very responsible behavior and so following the rules and really uh, maintaining and, 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 and playing by the book in a way. Um, just one word on Space 2030. This is a member state driven uh, process and it's, they are defining the strategy uh, for space in the UN uh, or in general space for the UN, but from the corpus perspective, which should cover this, this decade until uh, up to 2030. And why 2030? Because 2030 is the, is the milestone, uh, which is um, in a way targeted by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, but it's also one of the milestones in the COP21 Paris Ch Climate Change Agreement and also is the final milestone of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which is again, arriving in 2030. The next one, please. Um, just a few words on the fact that for the first time last year, uh, we worked with the, um, with the uh, presidency of the G20, uh, last year was uh, Saudi Arabia, this year is Italy, and uh, what we wanted to do was to underline in the under the umbrella of the G20 that again space is an indispensable tool for leaders to decide about what they want to do about their actions, and so we um, prepared a a sort of um, a white paper with the Office for Outer Space Affairs, which informed the process called Space 20. So we had, uh, in reality, the first space economy leaders meeting, uh, where we brought together the heads of the space agencies of the G20 countries, um, in reality, G19 plus EU, as the leaders of the space economy ecosystem. And uh, in reality, the goal was to explore the role of space economy in shaping new frontiers in the global economy and how uh, this could contribute to the international uses of space while maximizing these economic benefits. And um, in just in case you, you would be interested in that, the white paper has been then approved at the Space 20 event on the 7th of October last year. It was virtual, uh, but it was quite successful. And so if you are interested in getting also a copy of the two pages um, white paper, uh, more than welcome, you can ask and we can send it to you, uh, even if I believe it's also published on our website. The next one, please. And if we talk now about capacity building, I would like to mention quickly uh, that uh, I, I said that already that in, um, in 2015, after the approval of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we re remapped all the activities. And so we were looking at the areas where um, we were not uh, strictly addressing um, or directly addressing an SDG. So let me make an example, space for water. Space for water is a post September 2015 project or initiative. We didn't have anything so specific, which was targeting SDG number six, which is clean water and sanitation. Um, and so the same for space for women. Um, we combine here SDG four, which is quality education and SDG five, which is gender empowerment. And we put together uh, space for women, which is by the way, um, and you can find that there are relevant websites and a lot of information. Um, UN Spider and GNSS, uh, ICG, were already uh, initiatives and in, uh, in programs, um, I mean, active uh, before September 2015, when all the others were not. 
uh, access to space for all the way just the first uh, the first elements that but it's probably one of the most interesting uh, flagship initiatives we ever put together and we are also now we have space for youth already third edition this year is linked to cop 26 so climate change space solution for the pacific is another interesting a good model for cooperation where we try really to understand the needs in this case of a group of states that the pacific island states and then we go for phase two because in phase one we understood the needs we selected a couple of key pilot projects and now we are going in phase two where we'll, we will deliver the space-based solutions to uh, to that region and uh, space economy we will go there a little bit space law for new space actors is exactly what I was mentioning. It's a new project, uh, it's a new initiative, a couple of years. And it's extremely interesting because again, it's helping new players to, uh, to, to really start with a responsible behavior. And other uh, initiatives under development, uh, in particular with a lot of focus this year, is the space for climate action. Next one, please. Now, focusing a little bit on the space economy initiatives and, and trying to really, the goal is to ensure long-term prosperity. What we want to do is to create a multi-stakeholder platform, um, really trying to uh, strengthen the economies of emerging and non-space-faring nations through capacity building about advisory services, events, and learning material. Now, uh, clearly what we want to do is really to increase the global awareness and understanding on how space, the space sector can help and can even reinforce socioeconomic development in these countries. Also support countries to scale up their growth, to deliver strong, responsible and sustainable national space economies. And also we want to enhance cooperation is our, our mantra in a way across the global space sector, including public and private stakeholders. The next one, please. Um, you can find this report, uh, the, space economy, the Space Economy Initiative on our website. Um, what we did last year in full pandemic was to um, was really to uh, start uh, this new series. Uh, we organized seven webinars uh, and uh, it was extremely interesting because um, it's, it's really, uh, I mean, one after the other. So introducing space economy, make the case for science, how to scale up, access to finance, international cooperation, innovation and growth, and building back better. The building back better is extremely important for another initiative that we are uh, currently starting together with the World Economic Forum. The next one, please. Um, the current plan, the current work plan is to have the Space Economy Initiative run over the next three years. Um, and the activities that we are expecting to put in place are tailored around three core services. The first one, as I said, is more on awareness raising. So we uh, are now working on a new series of virtual events uh, into 2021 and we will start with an africa focus day event in may 2021 um the second block is uh, more on the e-learning side and so we will work on space we will uh, in a way train on space economy management of satellite services policy international regulations and law and finance and then last but not least, capacity building in research and development, training, technical advisory missions, report and recommendations. As I was mentioning, um, looking at building back better, we made a proposal to the World Economic Forum to work with us on, um, on uh, um, let's say, try to have another series of events uh, focusing on the role that space can play in the Great Reset, which is the main theme of the World Economic Forum this year. It was also the main theme 
in, in the first virtual part of Davos this year. So, uh, and so under the theme of space for the great reset, we are really trying to um, address topics like climate action, economic growth and access to space linked to the great reset, linked to how we need to build back better, linked to the fact that we need to prepare now for the post COVID-19 pandemic phase. Uh, we need to prepare, uh, member states need to prepare if we want to really have a good restart on um, using space as a tool also for doing so. Next one, please. Um, for access to space for all, I, I, I would need uh, half a day, but I'll be very quick. This is an initiative which is growing and growing. As you can see, we have in this initiative uh, space agencies. In particular, we have the China Manned Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the Japanese, the Japanese Space Agency, the Japan uh, Aerospace Exploration Agency, and NASA. We have private companies, Air currently Airbus, Avio, and Sierra Nevada Corporation. And we have research institutes like the Keldish Institute of Applied Mathematics and the German Aerospace Center, ZAP. Now, we are discussing with a lot of other partners. The mechanism is always the same. It's a triangular cooperation. We have the UN at the center. Uh, we, uh, we agree, we make agreements with partners from developed countries, as you can see here, and they offer in-kind activities. For example, Kibo Cube with JAXA, which was the, the first one together with ZAN. Well, what we do, they offer us, uh, in, in the case of, of Kibo Cube under, under Access to Space for Over JAXA, with JAXA, as I was saying, they offer us one or two slots per year, now it's two slots per year, for a one unit CubeSat, we do a selection, so a, a competitive call. We do a selection. The winner then will start working with JAXA. And JAXA is offering support in um, the launch campaign, in, uh, in the launch itself, in the deployment, and in the first phase of the operation. All of this is free of charge. It's free of charge, obviously, for the winner of the competition coming from a developing country, but for JAXA, is, is quite a, a, a huge support that they are providing us. And this is true for all the others. And this is also thanks to the fact that we are really, um, as I said, we are a sort of a center of gravity of all the, this big network of experts all over the world in the space community. And so we can connect dots and we can put emerging, emerging and developing countries in contact with developed countries. And in this way, we foster international cooperation, but we also foster capacity building and we help member states to grow. The next one, please. Well, this is uh, quite a good collection of, uh, of pictures. Uh, the, first, uh, the first deployment uh, of, uh, of the Kenya satellite. Kenya was the first one in 2018. Last year in full pandemic, we had the deployment of Quetzal Uno from Guatemala. Um, and then uh, oh, we are now preparing for uh, the next one, uh, which has been already handed over to JAXA just a few days ago, uh, and it's from Mauritius. And, um, and uh, so this uh, CubeSat, MirSat 1, uh, should be in orbit, I would say, before uh, half of the year is over, which means probably May, June, the satellites uh, should be the satellite should be deployed from the space station. Now we are waiting for the final confirmation of the launch date, uh, and then uh, from JAXA, and then we will have the deployment. So it's a great opportunity. These two countries, Kenya and Guatemala, never had the satellite in orbit before. It, and the Kenya one in 2018 was the first satellite ever launched in history under the auspices of the United Nations. And we are really waiting for Mauritius becoming the third uh, spacefaring countries under the auspices of the UN and counting. Next one, please. 
Um, I mentioned already two or three times space law for new space actors because it's really something that I, I, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, I believe is a very good initiative because it's really trying to foster responsible national space activities, responsible behavior uh, for all new, the, for the new uh, actors. And uh, we, uh, we identify needs and we deliver tailored advisory services depending on the country. Uh, this project is also um, targeted to uh, raise global awareness um, on the fundamental, prin fundamental principles of international space law and also support the implementation of the existing normative frameworks, the registration convention, the space debris mitigation guidelines, etc. Next one, please. And if we talk about space for women, I already mentioned that we combine the SDG 4 quality education and SDG 5 gender equality. Um, we just uh, um, have uh, uh, a space for women. I mean, we are creating a network and we have also a mentoring platform uh, for advocacy and awareness raising. We provide uh, advice, we provide research and data, knowledge management, and evidence based awareness raising. We facilitate capacity building and training on access to and use of space technologies uh, to train, generate skills, and foster the, uh, knowledge. Uh, we also communicate the opportunities of STEM education, also to facilitate access to space, edu space education and careers. And we try really to empower young women and girls uh, to be the beneficiary of and active and integral contributors to space solutions. And this is quite a, a successful uh, project. And, uh, we really want to push it um, even more, like all the others, by the way. Space for Youth is uh, uh, started three years ago, as I said. It's also linked to the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres strategy on youth. Um, we uh, signed an agreement with the Space Generation Advisory Council so to provide a platform to share ideas and experiences. Uh, we had already two competitions in 2019 and 2020. This year, um, is will has been accepted as part of COP26, COP26 uh, Youth Climate Summit, which will take place in Italy at the end of September. Um, and, uh, and so we will uh, uh, target the, uh, this competition on, on climate and in particular for climate mitigation and adaptation. So stay tuned because this competition is going to be launched beginning of March. Next one, please. Uh, getting close to the to the end of the presentation, I would like to mention the World Space Forum, which is one of the platforms that uh, was was created uh, quite recently. Um, this year will be the third edition of the World Space Forum, and the idea is really to convene stakeholders, all the stakeholders, for a better future. Because you know, in the UN system, we talk a lot with with member states. But we need to hear the voice of all the other stakeholders in, also, uh, in order also for UNUSA to be able then to present also better information, the best, in, best information possible to member states. So it's, it's always in the interest, in the final interest of member states. And, um, and the pillars around which we have been working until now is space for humanity, space for our planet, space for economy and sustainable future in space. This year, in Vienna, uh, we will have the World Space Forum uh, Space for Climate Action. Um, and for the first time, we will have what we call the space, the World Space Forum Action Report. So um, we will collect space solutions from all the potential stakeholders to secure broader inclusion of space solutions and generate more space resources for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. We also call for global action for space safety and sustainability, and also to foster partnerships to overcome the growing space divide. So in a way, uh, the action report will form a key element of the future forums and represents a valuable document containing individual as well as joint efforts, promoting collaboration and feeding into UNUSA initiatives. And as I said, this year is strongly focused on climate. Next one, please. So uh, 
I hope that this give, even if quite um, a quick overview of certain of the main activities, even if a uh, few of them I had clearly to skip uh, because uh, it was impossible to go even if very top level on all of them. Um, overall, I, I would like to underline that the main mandate we have, the main goal we have is really to bring the benefits of space to everyone everywhere. I thank you all of you very much for listening. And you can stay in touch with us. You see all in this presentation, all the various uh, social media you, through which you can follow us. And, uh, but we are always at your, I mean, always available if you need to get more information. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Simonetta. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation and for this view of all the activities and challenges of the United Nations Office for Outer Space. There has been, uh, many questions in the in the chat and in the Q&A, okay. but let me ask a question. I apologize because it's a little bit a part of the main line of your presentation, but this is a question that many people have today in the world. And yeah. You have been director of the human space flight at the European Space Agency. You are one of the most qualified people to answer. Is It's when we can expect human flight in Mars. Huh. Well... <laughs> Uh, uh, sometimes I, I can joke on that because um, when I was at the Italian Space Agency, so even before the European Space Agency, I was working with NASA uh, on a Mars sample return. So a simple <laughs> mission, which was supposed to bring back samples from the Mars surface and, and, and subsurface. And the target launch date was at that time, 2003. Now, uh, the point is that going to Mars in, in any case, going to space sounds easy, it's not. In particular, when you have humans in the loop, because the safety measures that you have to uh, consider are, I mean, unbelievable. The point is that it depends on the uh, interest, the political willingness to do that, because still we have to de develop a certain number of technologies but with the right, the, the right skills are there all, all over the world. It's a question of political willingness and also the financial support, because clearly when you have to develop, when you have to reach so challenges goals, you need to develop disruptive technologies, which then not necessarily immediately, but then these technologies uh, bring a lot of benefits on earth. Um, Again, the, the, you, you cannot see immediately the advantage, but if you look at how people were skeptical against space just a few years ago, I was receiving, uh, now it's not anymore the case, but a few years ago, I was always receiving the question, why you are spending so much money to go to Mars instead of building hospitals? And then you have to explain that in reality, what we can bring back from space in terms of improving the quality of life on Earth is unbelievable. Probably uh, a few years ago, the space community was failing a little bit in transferring this information. But I believe now more and more the, the citizens on the streets, so the general public, they understand not only the inspirational side of landing on Mars, like for example, perseverance yesterday and not only perseverance because it's you know it's it's really interesting how how many countries are trying really to land on on the moon and mars and beyond uh but but the point is that the technologies you develop are so important for the day-by-day -day life that again without this we um we couldn't even uh leave uh as we do these very years thank you thank you very much and um well, hope that that we can we can see it soon. As I said, there are many questions from from different um, continents. Let's go for a question from Brazil. Could you further develop the mentoring platform and the Space for Women network for advocacy and awareness raising? I think we do need, we do need to encourage young women to be part of the space industry in Brazil. Well, Brazil uh, is one of the countries with which we are working very hard on this. Uh, we have an agreement between the Office for Outer Space Affairs and the Ministry for Science, in particular, okay, 
the minister in Brazil is Marcos Pontes, so is uh, is a former astronaut. So you can imagine. <laughs> By the way, we know each other since long. So we signed an agreement, and among other things, uh, we are working together on a big event, hopefully in twenty twenty in twenty twenty one, pandemic permitting, uh, uh, to really devoted to space for women. And uh, uh, all the information can be found on the Space for Women website and can be also reached through our website. But um, we can send uh, uh, the, 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 the person may making the question all the information. We have, uh, we started last year with the selection of the first group of mentors. We just had a few days ago, a lesson learn meeting with all the mentors because we are preparing for the second round. So just in a few days, uh, you will have a new call um, where we are looking really for, um, for uh, uh, new mentors. And uh, you know, it's, it's a process because the, the mechanism that we are trying to put together is on one side to really try to accompany uh, young uh, women and girls who want to have a career in space through their career process, which takes a lot of time. So it's a long-term program. And at the same time, we are trying really to have uh, short-term results. And so it's, it's a combination of the two. And I believe it's uh, one of the reasons why this program is so successful is just because as to, 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 I mean, for a lot of reasons, but for sure there are the two components. And Brazil is one of the main partners for us in this, uh, in this field. Okay, thank you. There is several questions from Hernan Villagran. I will select some of those questions. One is, how can I get more involved in the space for Asia Pacific initiative you just mentioned? Okay, the Asia Pacific uh, initiative is quite interesting. It's another role model because um, it was originated by the fact that, uh, uh, let me say this because uh, it's, it's important also to understand the mechanisms that we use. It was originated by the fact that um, New Zealand was not a member of the committee since a few years ago. They became a member. And uh, what I do usually, I select uh, every year two or three key countries. Uh, and I go for an institutional visit, visiting ministers, presenting the importance of space, blah, blah, blah. In this uh, specific case, I went to New Zealand and I also met uh, with a lot of ambassadors of the Pacific Island states to discover that they didn't know that space could help them in solving a certain number of, of problems they had. So what we did, uh, we uh, started the first phase um, where we, as I said, we made a sort of, uh, we would try to understand uh, what was needed. And then we are now preparing the second phase. Um, if you want to, is this, uh, this person wants to be involved with us, again, we can send more information and also the, per the the staff members, the, the, the project officer in, in UNUSA in charge of this. And so they can start exchanging views in and cooperating if it is, this is the case. Thank you very much. There is another question from Sa Vasco. The question is, what type of coordination is being made between UNOSA and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, the IOC? With, with UNESCO, not yet so much. Uh, and the reason is that um, the office has been changing positioning in the system. So when I arrived as director March 2014, um, it, it was not so developed as it is today. So today the office is also in a different configuration in the UN system, because now I report directly to the secretary general, which was not fully the case a few years ago. And so what I'm trying to do now is really to reinforce all the relationships with the other UN entities. We have a wonderful mechanism in place since a bit called UN Space, uh, where we have regular meetings uh, every year and the participation is, is uh, not mandatory. So it's on a voluntary basis for the other UN entities. Every year we publish a different report on different topics. And, um, and this topic could be one of, uh, I mean, could be an interesting topic to be tackled uh, in the next coming years. So, so thank you very much for the question. I, I, I take note. Okay, thank you very much. There is another question from South Africa. 
How can African stakeholders join capacity building initiatives still under development, such as space for climate actions and space to global health, to help UNOSA better tailor this initiative for emerging economies? Well, um, the one of the best way to interact with us is really to participate actively to our events. Because clearly what we are really looking for with all these platforms we create and all with these opportunities to exchange views is exactly that, to collect information, to collect inputs, to collect needs, to collect requirements. So I, I suggest that first of all, uh, you get in touch uh, with, the, with the various people and that is always on, under each initiative, there is uh, an email uh, that you can use uh, it is differentiated for each activity. So it goes to the people who are really working on that subject. It's not, in, it doesn't go in a sort of a black hole. Uh, so it's well-structured. And, uh, and second, um, participating to events, uh, seminars, virtual events, uh, webinars, etc., is the best way to interact with us and to provide information. So bilateral information, but also uh, multilateral, I mean, participating to the events. Thank you very much. There is, there is a question from the US. This mm -hmm. question from the US is, um, the space industry is still using outdated linear model of production and economic optimization. How can the space industry embrace the zero carbon circular economy? What are the current barriers for real space sustainability? Well, this is the question of the century, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and everyone is struggling, you know. Um, what we really would like to do for our, from our perspective is, is to stimulate um, all the stakeholders, in particular the private sector, to have more and more a social, let's say, a social responsibility. So this is also the basis of what we do with the Space for Climate Action and with the space for the Great Reset. So trying to work with the private sector step by step to have them understanding that following, let's say the, 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 the rules of the road is in their own interest. And I have to tell you, my personal experience in the last few years with the private sector, at least the private sector we are dealing with, the, the companies we are dealing with, and quite big by the way, they are very sensitive to this. It cannot be done overnight, so it's a long process. But the fact that they have the mindset to work with us to support developing countries with their own resources, in my opinion, is extremely important. It's the first step towards a more social uh, uh, and correct responsibility, correct behavior. And yes, we started a few years ago, and I'm sure that also with the Green Deal in the EU, and a, and a lot of other activities that we are having also with the World Economic Forum. Yes, it's not tomorrow. It's not the day after tomorrow, but we are improving a lot. Thanks. There, let's come back to another question from, from Hernan Villagran. He asked, will you promote a more active participation of these United Nations agencies you lead in the coming COP26 climate change conference? Absolutely. Uh, as I said, uh, in the COP26 youth, we have already uh, an approved activity and we are now working also. And by the way, it's the first youth summit on climate ever. Huh? So it's extremely important. Uh, this year, just to clarify for all the participants, uh, the COP26, is the, the, the leadership is co-shared by uh, between UK and Italy. So the real summit COP26 will take place late in the, later in the year in Glasgow, in UK. But in Italy, in end of September, beginning of October, there will be two events, the pre-COP, so it's a sort of uh, preparatory meeting, plus the first ever COP Youth Summit. Huh? And so we combined, we made a proposal, just to be accepted two, two days ago, um, we made a proposal to link uh, our competition on space for youth to COP26, as I said, to, to climate in general, but to COP26. We have other initiatives together with the UK, but also with other UN entities to present proposals 
for Glasgow, so for the COP26 summit together. We have already an, an activity, uh, activity quite well developed with the Agency for the Atomic Energy, which is also based in Vienna, and other initiatives that we are discussing also with the UK government, because clearly you cannot just make a proposal, you cannot just have your own ideas, it has to fit with the overall plan of the government leading, uh, in this case, UK. Thank you very much. There is another question from Nigeria. That's a difficult question. Thanks for the very informative presentation, Dr. DePipo. If there is a growing number of satellites orbiting around the Earth and space debris is already a problem, what is the solution to mitigate the orbit overcrowding in the long term? Okay, first of all, always follow the space debris mitigation guidelines because uh, this is mandatory, even if the, the, there are guidelines, so they're not mandatory, but it's absolutely necessary that all the actors, everyone l l sending satellites in orbit, the more they follow the space uh, debris mitigation guidelines, the more we will have control reentry. And when a satellite is not anymore operational, comes back, burns into the atmosphere and it's done, okay? There are a lot of potential solutions. We are really tackling space debris as a serious topic with the Office for Outer Space Affairs. I don't know if you noticed, but we, ju we just launched a campaign together with the European Space Agency. You will see every week a, an infographics and a podcast uh, with experts from both the European Space Agency and the Office for Outer Space Affairs explaining the various elements around, I mean, the, the various, I'd say, the various angles of the space debris issue. Uh, and we, uh, it's nine, uh, nine uh, uh, series, one uh, each week, and we already issued the second just, uh, just yesterday or the day before. So stay tuned every week. You look at, the, at our uh, social media, you will see what we are doing. We have also other initiatives. We are working with um, the UK government um, and, and with other uh, interested uh, uh, countries to really help us in, because you know, in, um, in 2019, the committee approved the so-called um, long-term sustainability guidelines, but also space debris is part. And so what we would like to do now, for example, with the UK government, together with the UK government, which is supporting us also financially to do so, to really increase awareness on the importance of maintaining uh, the long-term sustainability, and also what we call the three S, safety, security, and sustainability. My point is that if we really want to develop a space economy, we need to keep the space environment clean, okay? And otherwise it's difficult to find, uh, to find investors, it's difficult to have a stable business plan, et cetera, et cetera. So we cannot talk about a space economy in reality in space without a safe, secure and sustainable space environment. So uh, all these elements are interconnected. On top of that, we have a project together with the UAE Space Agency supported by the UAE, so the, the Emirates uh, government. Uh, to develop uh, a center devoted to space sustainability. So we have already a lot of initiatives uh, and they're all very recent, uh, as I said, because the office had to go through a profound transformation in the last few years. And uh, so I'm very happy that this kind of questions are put on the table because they allow me to give even more information on the office. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. We have another question. In fact, there are two questions from Mahavan Palan. The question mm -hmm. is, when will there be permanent residency in outer space, apart from the rolling residency in the ISS? Also, when can we have more mineral mining from outer meteor as a commercial entity? Well, on the second question, it's just a question of technologies and a question of uh, how much money uh, they want to invest. There is one element, which is the, that we are now focusing more and more is planetary protection. And the, and the fact is that, uh, when you go uh, on, a, on a different celestial body, you land, uh, you need to be sure that you are not bringing uh, there any bacteria, any form of life from earth, because otherwise it would be, you know, infected in a way. And then you have also to be sure that when you come back, 
because we don't know what we are going to find, um, we are protected. So planetary protection is becoming more and more important. And the Office for Outer Space Affairs is working with COSPER uh, to, uh, to try to really take all this issue and trying to include planetary protection more and more also in the training courses and the capacity building activities that we do. Because if we start to have commercial entities landing on the moon, landing on Mars, or going on an asteroid and mining it, the rules of planetary protection must be followed. Okay, thank you. There is another uh, question which is very, very well directed to you. The question is from Sa Vasco. Exists already a kind of law of the space as it exists law of the sea? Well, we have the treaties, the five treaties, we have the five principles and a lot of guidelines. Uh, the way in which the system works is that uh, all the decisions taken in Vienna at COPUS are taken by consensus, so we don't vote. Which means that, for example, the 21 guidelines on the long-term sustainability have been agreed word by word by the 95 member states. So it's not hard law, I mean, because it's, it's really it's not uh, committing law in a way. Uh, because they are guidelines, but the fact that the member states have been working so hard to find a solution and to find a compromise in order to be able to approve it, approve the, the full package by consensus, it means that they really want to abide to that. So it means that they follow the guidelines uh, properly. The, the, the point is that 95 member states out of 193 is only half of them. So what we do need, that this is an argument that, I mean, a topic that I'm putting uh, on the table every time I can, there is a need of what we call global space governance. And I advocate that the one, the only entity which can really take all this issue, the global space governance decided by member states, but then in the implementation phase can only be the Office for Outer Space Affairs. Uh, and, uh, but this is a long, discussion because it's something that is going at the, at the speed that was not expected. Uh, but the commercial sector is really, really pushing for having uh, precise rules to be followed. And so uh, it's, it's my duty to try to inform member states in, in, in the best way possible so that at, at the end, we can really have a system as global space governance in place, the sooner the better. Thanks. I mean, it's already 10 minutes past the time, and uh, there are many more questions. It is incredible the, the interest of the audience in, in us. Maybe the last one, because I know also you yeah. have important. Yeah, news. absolutely. Yeah. The last one, it's uh, from Tony Sefton. It's uh, thanks for a nice presentation. Regarding the space debris removal initiative you mentioned, how do you see this being coordinated and financed going forward? Well, uh, the, what we do is not to support the, the, the space uh, removal um, uh, initiative. The, there is no such an initiative. What I can say is that there are countries all over the world, which are uh, at least three or four, uh, which are developing uh, the technology uh, to uh, actively remove debris in orbit. Um, this has to be regulated. What we can do, uh, but, but the decision on how, to on how to regulate is in the hands of member states. What we can do as the Office for Outer Space Affairs is to increase awareness of the importance of uh, keeping uh, the space environment clean, to follow the space debris mitigation guideline, and to try really to, uh, to put in place all the measures possible in order to do so. Uh, it's a process that we are starting and increasing awareness is always the first step because in this manner all the stakeholders become more aware and so more supportive of pushing a little bit the system in finding the right solution. Thank you very much Simonetta, thank you very much for the for the answering all those questions and for the presentation. I apologize for many many persons which are doing questions but we are on type. I think they can direct those questions to us and we can see how we, we can we can let them reach and, and uh, how we can be answered. And uh, again, thank you very much. That has been really uh, brilliant. And uh, from the Air Center, it has been a very special day. And uh, after thank you. landing in March, this is 
this is a very impressive uh, session of our network in five days. Thank you very much to you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you very much to everyone. Bye. Thank you very much to all, to all participants. We have uh, active participation from different continents, from, from more than 40 countries. Thank you very much. And uh, well, stay tuned for next uh, Friday. Ciao.